I'm Charlotte Harper, Director of Public Programs at Hill Center. Hill Center is located at the Old Naval Hospital in Washington, DC. But as our community, our city, and our country continue to grapple with the coronavirus outbreak, we will be coming to your home from our homes. Again, thank you for joining us. Tonight, Bill Press welcomes Carol Lenig and Philip Rucker, both of the Washington Post, to discuss their book, A Very Stable Genius, Donald J. Trump's Testing of America. We encourage you to buy the book from our local bookstore, East City Bookshop. Thanks so much and uh, good evening, everybody. Good to see you all um, because of the coronavirus. Of course, I'm sorry that we're not all able to be together at the Hill Center, but thank you for joining us online for a very, very special program uh, here for Talk of the Hill. You know, I've told you many times how lucky we are, and you all agree, to have such a great newspaper here in Washington, D.C. We've had some great people from the Washington Post, investigative reporter David Fahrenholt, uh, columnist Ruth Marcus, just at our last meeting together. Uh, and tonight we are joined by two of the Washington Post's very, very top reporters, Carol Lenning and Phil Rucker. They are co-authors of this great new book, A Very Stable Genius. Donald J. Trump's Testing of America, New York Times bestseller, and it's been on the bestseller list for the last six weeks or so. Carol and Phil, thank you so much, and congratulations. Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here. Hey, Phil, good to see you too. Yeah, you too, Bill. I wish we could have done this in person, but uh, we're glad to make this work through Zoom, and hello to everybody out there. You start with, uh, your book is a step-by-step -step account of the first three years of the Trump administration. But let's flash forward to today. Um, just before we began uh, this little broadcast, I checked and the latest number, numbers are 209,000 cases of coronavirus in this country with over 4,600 dead so far. What did you guys learn about Donald Trump's decision-making process or his governing style that we see reflected in his handling of the coronavirus pandemic? You know, Bill, I, I feel like Phil and I probably both are a bit haunted watching what's unfolding right now because so many of the sources that spoke to both of us for the book warned us about two things. One, the sort of winging it quality that the president has in all of his decision-making, the ad-libbing, the, the desire to win essentially and in burnishing his own image always. These are his top priorities. That was the first thing which we see on display. And the second thing they warned Phil and I about over and over again was this president had never really handled a real crisis. And they feared for that moment because those, those governing styles, if you can call them governing, don't work in this setting. Um, and, and I think we, and Phil has reported that beautifully over the last few weeks of how that is not working because this is about facts and science and life and death. And Phil, what did you learn about how much uh, weight the president gives to experts or listening to others or taking time to learn? A, a problem like this? Yeah, you know, Bill, the, uh, the first three years of this presidency taught us a lot about how Donald Trump consumes information, how he makes decisions, and uh, the fruit has been, been born, so to speak, uh, these past few weeks through the coronavirus crisis in the country, the pandemic. The president tunes out the expertise of the people in the government who are there uh, to bring him information, to bring him facts and knowledge and intelligence. He believes he's his own uh, best expert, that he knows better than the generals, better than the, the CIA officers, better than the scientists uh, in the government. And, and so to that end, he has tuned out uh, over the years a lot of what they've told him on a range of topics. Uh, but we saw that play out the last few months on the coronavirus, where the experts were saying uh, this virus is spreading fast in China. It's spreading across to Europe. It could be deadly. It's much more contagious than the seasonal flu. And yet the president kept uh, tuning that out and, and believing in his gut. And what his gut told him 
uh, was that this wasn't going to be very bad. Only a few Americans might die, that it's going to miraculously disappear, that sometime in the spring when the weather gets warmer, it's all going to vanish and go poof. And of course, that's not what the science shows. That's not what the data uh, has shown the last few weeks. And so now he's grappling with this crisis very behind uh, in preparing for this moment. But that's in part because of his reluctance uh, to take the advice of the experts and to trust uh, the facts and the data that's presented to him uh, as the president of the United States. Did you see any evidence, Carol, that Donald Trump could change his mind? Well, he changes his mind for sure and has changed his mind multiple times during this crisis. I mean, if you want to ask the question about past tense, the time that we cover in the book, that's one question. Mm -hmm. you look at the coronavirus today, you see that the president has changed his mind, it, not admitted that he's changed his mind, <laughs> but multiple times has said, um, okay, here's what I am saying now. And at one point, he basically realized this was going to cost him horrifically with his economic advisors, investors that he believes, billionaires that he, that he thinks and trusts have the best um, advice to give. He saw this was going to cost him in the economy, which is what he thinks is the key to him being reelected. And so his pronouncement that we should all come out of our homes and everything would be safe to, to restart the economy in Easter, he's now adjusted that and changed his mind. But again, the motivation is so often what is the best thing for Donald Trump, which is what our sources warned us about. His, his interest in the country and its safety is not always foremost. And, and Phil, you have been reporting uh, brilliantly, I might add, about this pivot that we've seen, that we saw in Donald Trump. Um, what brought meaning, instead of denial, really taking it seriously, as Carol pointed out, instead of Easter Sunday, then going to April 30. What brought about that pivot? And is it for real? And will it stick? Yeah, you know, Bill, uh, it's a great question. This is just in the last few days. What the president has said publicly is that he made this decision based on, on the data that were presented to him by Dr. Fauci and Dr. Birx uh, over the weekend that mm -hmm. they said in a worst case scenario in the United States, up to 2.2 million Americans could die from the coronavirus. And that if we were to extend social distancing, they could limit that to a best case scenario of 100,000 to 240,000. That's what Trump has said publicly. But what we know from our reporting behind the scenes is that he was motivated by other factors, perhaps even more so uh, than what the data and the science showed. Uh, first of all, over the weekend, he saw images of one of the hospitals in the Queens neighborhood where he grew up uh, overrun with coronavirus patients, body bags being pulled out of the hospital and loaded into freezer trucks. And that left an indelible mark on him because it suddenly was personal. This was a place that he knew. Uh, he knew that mm -hmm. hospital, he'd driven by it so many times and all of a sudden it affected him personally. He also heard from a friend uh, who had coronavirus and, and fell into a coma in the hospital. So again, it was personal. And then he thought about the politics of it, and he was warned by Senator Lindsey Graham uh, and a host of other allies of his that if he were to reopen the economy and more people were to die after that, he would be blamed for those deaths, that the blood literally would be on his hands uh, come election day in November. And that was something that he feared. He didn't want to take that gamble. And so what he really prioritizes in making decisions, and we've seen this as a pattern uh, documented in the book, he thinks about the personal and the political all the time. It's always about his self-image, how he feels about it himself, uh, and whether it's going to help him politically uh, win an election or win the day or survive to live to the next day. Right. And, and Carol, you mentioned the politics. It's too early, isn't it, to know politically what the impact of the coronavirus will be on this election, on Donald Trump, on Joe Biden, or anybody else? What do we, but what do we know now? What we know now are, is that, you know, people who have supported Donald Trump, that support is strengthening. It's getting more um, muscular. And mm -hmm. his, his popularity ratings are rising uh, in the midst of this crisis, which sort of um, stuns a lot of his critics because they can document, as the Post has documented, all of the ways in which he may have exacerbated um, the crisis by putting it off, by poo-pooing it, by not responding forcefully and aggressively early on. 
you know, in, in late January when there were classified briefings about the way in which this could disrupt our lives, the um, number of Americans that could die. But as popularity is rising, that is a feature of American politics when a country is under assault, as we are under assault now by the virus, uh, people look to a president to be their savior, their supporter, their rock. And uh, many pol political pollsters have said that his popularity rising is a feature of that, uh, people wanting somebody to rally behind. You might remember George W. Bush was much hated right before 9-11 and his popularity zoomed. Of course, he handled the crisis in a, in a little more rigorous and disciplined way than uh, President Trump has now. And yet his still, that same feature was a piece of his popularity rising immediately after a country under attack. Uh, and for now, uh, the president really has the political field to himself, in effect. I mean, I mean, Joe Biden tries every day to get out there, but there's no primaries taking place. There's no argument over policy. It's the Trump show. It is, Bill. And, and President Trump seems to think that this works for him politically. It's one of the reasons why he decides to do these briefings himself. Uh, every evening and why he stretches them out. So the, the briefing the other day was more than two hours long. These are, this, that's extraordinary. <laughs> we don't see that at the White House normally because he thinks he can dominate the stage, uh, so to speak, but it's unclear and it's far too early to tell whether all of that time in front of the American people is actually helping him or hurting him. You know, what sort of conclusions voters are drawing from his performance uh, and from frankly, his ability to manage this pandemic and this crisis, but you're right about the Democratic campaign. It's basically frozen in place. Bernie Sanders uh, continues to be a candidate. He and Joe Biden are doing virtual town hall meetings and media interviews from their basements or their offices uh, on, on a phone and, and on a camera. There, there's not the typical campaigning we're used to, and it's unclear, frankly, when that's gonna resume. There's even talk now that the Democratic National Convention scheduled for July uh, could be delayed into August or even the fall. Now, I saw that Joe Biden has said he doesn't see how there could possibly be a convention as we That's know right. conventions to be with all those crowded rooms and, and that the floor of the convention, how it could possibly happen in July. It's hard, it's hard to imagine. But, but Carol, the president, we know in the beginning was, um, he continued to hold some political rallies even while talk of coronavirus started. And then he aban reluctantly abandoned those. But he's discovered a new kind of political rally, hasn't he, as Phil sort of indicated. Yeah. I mean, the briefings are the new rallies, aren't they? Of course, it's the Trump show, you know, for two hours, sometimes one and a half hours. Um, it's also a little bit disconcerting because this is a setting in which he's supposed to be advising the country about the steps they should take to pr protect themselves. But as, as has been reported by our paper and so many others, he disagrees and disputes the actual material that his advisors, his scientific advisors, literally have uttered just moments ago, steps away from him. Um, you know, this happened with the anti-malarial drug that he said he just feels like it could work. It looks good to him. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's going to work. Well, Fauci, Dr. Fauci said, yeah, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> Um, it's not been tested, it's not been reviewed, it's not peer reviewed. That's science that we're not accepting at this moment. And it's quite dangerous to take that anti-malarial for a lot of people. So it was, it's un unfortunate that he's using this setting to wing it. Um, but he is, I think, successfully touching base with a lot of people who are looking for answers. I've heard from people who said they are having their children sit around at dinner tables and, and stop what they're doing and watch his presentations to sort of hear almost like a fireside chat. What does the president say we should do? It would be nice if, if what he said was consistent with what the experts are saying. Right. And, and Phil, the president's sort of approach to 2020 was founded, there were like two planks of it. Um, I, I believe, and, and you've been reporting too at the post has. One was that the economy was booming and the market was soaring, and the other was that Joe Biden was failing and fading and was not going to be the nominee. He was probably going to be, he felt lucky and run against Bernie Sanders. Both of those planks are gone now, right? Yeah, you, I think that's right. And, and, and I would say that those are not equal planks. I think the president and his advisors considered the economy to be really the paramount uh, issue for him, helping him 
uh, in the re-election campaign in 2020. They were going to run on the economy. The numbers looked good, even if people's wages weren't going up or people felt uh, stressed or crunched or, or didn't really feel uh, personally in their families that the economy was so booming. Uh, the overall numbers, the stock market growth, uh, other indicators were very much showing uh, that this was a boom economy. And Trump, as you know, is a salesman. And he was going out on the campaign trail uh, from the beginning of this year, talking about the economy, uh, inflating the growth, saying it's the biggest and greatest in world history, which is not true. And now all of a sudden, poof, it, you know, it's gone. The markets have melted down. Uh, and, and Trump is grappling uh, to try to figure out how to salvage the economy, both as president, but also as candidate, because he knows that's his key for re-election. Uh, and of course, you see that Phil very strategically has placed a copy of uh, your book in back of him. Uh, I want to remind you again, we're talking with Phil Rucker and Carol Lenning, all co-authors of A Very Stable Genius. And another reminder that uh, East City Books right here on Capitol Hill is one of those businesses that is has been shuttered because it's considered non-essential. I hate to think of bookstores myself as being non-essential. I think they're very essential. Uh, but uh, East City Books is certainly uh, open online, and we encourage you to buy. I encourage you very, very much to buy and read uh, every page of A Very Stable Genius. So back to the book. Carol, let me start with you. Some of the things that struck me, one is I had the overall impression, not just from your book, but from following the news, of course, that there are two worlds out there. There's like the real world, if I can, and there's the Trump world. In a sense, did you get the sense that Donald Trump does like live in his own universe? You know, what I can tell you is what we learned from those sources. The people who worked at his shoulder, at the president's shoulder for weeks, months, and years. And he, remember, most of our sources are Republicans who wanted to see the president's agenda fulfilled, or they wanted a conservative agenda implemented inside his White House. And what they came away from with some, some mixture of horror and concern uh, on that spectrum, what they came away from that experience saying to us over and over again is that he sometimes, he doesn't take his briefings seriously. He doesn't take him information because he thinks he's the expert. They felt often when they were trying to explain things to him, um, it was an insult. It, it appeared to be an insult to him that they were going to tell him something about the Korean Peninsula. They were going to explain something to him about nuclear weapons. They were going to tell him a little bit about how NATO um, and how the alliance works and what each member's role is. That was an insult to him physically. Um, and so you can't help but feel that inside that White House, listening to those sources, that he's created a world in which what he thinks, what he thinks is true is true. And, and the hunches, as he said in, in a recent coronavirus uh, briefing, his hunches are the most important and his insight as a developer and, and business magnate uh, are the things that he feels will make the best decisions. That hasn't always proven true. Although sometimes to his credit, he's been really a genius and a master at some things um, to wit his, his political, political success, his ability to market himself, but in those impulsive decisions where he bases it on his hunches or his own version of what's real, it's been problematic. Well, in fact, the very title of your book, A Very Stable Genius, those, Phil, are not words that I would use to describe Donald Trump. Who does call him that? You know, I'm glad you raised this, Bill. Uh, those are actually Trump's own words. That's not the description that, that Carol and I have given to the subject of our book, but rather that's the self-description that the president has given himself. It's a phrase he first used uh, in early 2018 uh, when there was sort of a national discussion underway about his mental fitness, his psychological health, his acuity uh, for the job. And, you know, Trump went on Twitter and defended himself and said, I, you know, got elected. I'm, I'm a genius. I've always been very smart. I'm a very stable genius. And he's used that phrase at least five other times uh, since then. And in selecting the title for the book, Carol and I thought, uh, you know, it's really best to use the president's own words. This is, you know, a history yeah. of this period in the presidency, but it's also a character study of Donald J. Trump. And, and so we wanted to use his own description of himself and hold it up 
uh, almost as a mirror and use it to sp and stress test it against uh, the accounts of the more than 200 senior administration officials, advisors to the president, confidants of the president, uh, who we interviewed for this book. Of all of those hundreds of interviews, Carol, was Donald J. Trump one of them? He was not. Um, it's actually very disappointing to me and to Phil because uh, he, the president said he wanted to do an interview. He spoke with Phil and said, you know, um, you're a fair one. I, I'd like to get a serious, fair mm -hmm. book done. Come in, come in. I'm mm -hmm. paraphrasing a little bit. Many of those are the same words. And it was disappointing to us because, you know, we feel as though as reporters, we have an incredible duty to hear what all of the participants in a scene believed happened, what, they, what their reactions were, what their memories were. We vetted the material so carefully, people's calendars, their contemporaneous notes, multiple people corroborating the same event. But, you know, we still would have liked to hear what the president had to say about why he did what he did and what he was thinking in some of these moments. It's, um, it's too bad because we then went through that fact-checking process, an arduous fact-checking process, and even then, um, the White House was unable to constructively give us any feedback from the president about these moments. Um, even when they had decided he was not going to do an interview, they would not engage on those key facts that we wanted to check with them, which is uh, the basics of reporting. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm curious. I know the president, I mean, he called both of you uh, stone losers, and uh, he said that the book was basically just a whole series of lies, one lie after another. Was there any thing you reported in the book that you had to go back and say, oh, we got that wrong? No, <laughs> and I'm glad you raised that, Bill. The president did call it a work of fiction, but it's anything but. It's rigorously fact-checked uh, work of nonfiction. It's, it's truth, it's history, and you know we're really proud of the fact that it's now been out uh, for the public to read for more than two months, and there's not mm -hmm. a single piece of reporting that anybody, including the president, has contested uh, as inaccurate or, or lacking in context or, or anything of that nature. Yeah. So, Carol, one other thing that struck me is the turnover. I mean, it's been extraordinary. Her, the Less than three and a half years, the president has his now fourth chief of staff, I think, what, third defense secretary? second secretary of state, most of the cabinet have left, uh, as well as most of his senior staff. Uh, what does that say about working for this man or working in the White House? And I thought loyalty was important to him. Well, as we do document in this book, uh, sadly, loyalty is a one-way street with Donald Trump. He demands it, he expects it, but he doesn't return it uh, routinely, uh, consistently. He's on his fourth national security advisor, another sort of yeah. stunner when you think about how important national security is um, and, and is, was critical in this pandemic. And there's so many worries that people have about this moment because as Phil and I report, the guardrails are gone. The people who said to Donald Trump, in 2017 and early 2018, Mr. President, this is a bad idea. The people who took him aside privately, John Kelly, and said, I don't think you should do this, or you better consider this, those people are gone. So instead of John Kelly, you had Mick Mulvaney, uh, also replaced, by the way, quite recently. But, yeah. but Mick Mulvaney was willing to go along with some things that were very questionable from a legal standpoint and a national security interest standpoint. He, he agreed to help the president withhold aid to Ukraine in the middle of that saga, um, a move that was viewed by the Government Accountability Office as uh, illegal. You have Rex Tillerson, Secretary of State, gone, replaced by... Mike Pompeo, who also aided the president's sort of shadow government situation in Ukraine and has repeated the president's um, statements that are, are factually inaccurate as if they're probably appropriate or correct. It's, it's the adults that have left the room um, that this government could, could use right now in a crisis. And speaking of Rex Tillerson, uh, Phil, one of the most colorful parts of the book is your account of a meeting at the Pentagon 
with the president. The secretary of state was also there. Uh, tell us a little about, about that in terms of maybe easing yeah. Tillerson out the door. Yeah, well, Bill, this was a pretty dramatic moment uh, in the book. It's, it's July, I believe, of 2017. And Tillerson, uh, Secretary of State, as well as the Defense Secretary, Jim Mattis, and Gary Cohn, the National Economic Advisor, they wanted to try to teach the president. They were really alarmed by his lack of knowledge about world affairs, about geography, uh, about military deployments around the world, about trade alliances. So they brought him over to the Pentagon to a sacred room, a meeting room called the Tank. Uh, and, and sat him down for a tutorial session. And he's there with those advisors, but also the Joint Chiefs of Staff, all sorts of um, military brass. And as they're going through a presentation uh, for him, he got really uh, aggravated and irritated by the Schoolhouse Rocks vibe. Uh, and he started to bark and bellow uh, at the generals in front of him. He said, you know, the war in Afghanistan has been going on 17 years. It's a loser war, you're losers that we can't win that war in Afghanistan. He said, you're a bunch of dopes and babies. Those are the president's words. Uh, and then he said, I wouldn't go to war with you people. And that line really struck a nerve with folks in the room. It was emotional. Uh, one woman, a, a, an officer of the military had uh, tears coming out of her eyes. Someone else uh, covered his, his brow like this. So you know his facial reaction wouldn't be seen by the president. People were shuffling papers. Jim Mattis said nothing because uh, it turns out people felt he was genetically a Marine and wanted to respect the chain of command and didn't want to speak up to the commander in chief. The most striking silence came from Vice President Pence, whose own son uh, has served in, in Afghanistan and he wouldn't even stand up to the president to tell him, no, that's not a loser war. The people fighting there are not losers. Uh, but Rex Tillerson did confront the president, did stand up to him. Uh, you know, told him not to disrespect our soldiers, said they're not uh, there for money or profit or fortune for America. They're there to protect our country. And after the meeting broke up, Tillerson said uh, in a hallway to a number of his colleagues who were also in the room that the president was an effing moron. And it's a comment that later got reported uh, by NBC News and, and president found out about it. And at that point, uh, the relationship was really severed. The president uh, never thought of Tillerson the same way again. Kara, one other thing that uh, struck me, uh, so many things about the book, but in terms of the people that Donald Trump gets along with, he does seem to have a certain affinity for autocrats, right? I mean, he likes strong people like Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un. You know, what's that all about? What did you find out about that in your reporting? I'm glad you brought up Vladimir Putin because he is almost like a bromance obsession of Donald Trump's. Literally from before he was president, when he was president elect, he is asking, you know, one of his transition advisors who comes with him into the White House, when can I set up a meeting with Vladimir Putin? Can I do it now? Can I do it before the inauguration? And people are saying, you know, that's not really a good idea, boss, because you're not the president yet. Um, that's not so. That's not so good. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Right. But, um, the, I think that this is an important thing to recognize, which is Donald Trump has said to so many of his advisors, "I will make the deal. It's a man-to-man, -man, eye-to-eye situation. I can look them in the eye, and we can figure out, you know, if we're going to be able to get to this negotiation and whether we're going to make a good deal. It's all about deal making." And I think that because he sees himself as tough and strong, he's gonna do everything in a tough and strong way. He likes guys that look back at him tough and strong. He admires a lot of those features of Vladimir Putin's. Now, of course, Vladimir Putin has worked him uh, the way a KGB agent works um, anybody that they're trying to manipulate. He has privately told the president, you know, you and I could be great friends, but it's that deep state, those bureaucrats below us that just don't want us to get along. They give you information, they give me information that's inaccurate, trying to keep us apart. And um, that really plays into what Donald Trump believes, uh, though it is not the case. We have a history with Russia of being our adversary, and Rex Tillerson tried to advise the president about that and warn him. This guy wakes up in the morning, Mr. President, looking for a place where the US is vulnerable, and he goes there and tries to make it worse. So even though he seems really charming, please be on your guard with him. But the president doesn't see it that way. He respects Vladimir Putin's toughness, the way he runs his country, um, which is not in a democratic way. And 
he um, has tried to, to make quite a friendship as recently as a few days ago, um, getting on the phone again with him. I'm sorry, yesterday, getting on the phone again with him to try to uh, build that, that bromance that they have going. And in terms of Carol, uh, Phil, Carol uses the word deals and deal maker. That's, that's another thing that, that was one of Donald Trump's main planks when he was running for president, right? I'm the ultimate deal maker, the best deal maker ever. What successful deals has Donald Trump made as president? Uh, very few, Bill. You know, he, he did get the tax cuts through uh, at the end of his right. first year in office, which was uh, really the, the only major legislative achievement, save for the stimulus plan that just came through in this moment of a national emergency. But, you know, he has considered himself the master deal maker, and yet time and again has, has come up short in seeking deals. He has sought uh, more funding for the border wall than he's received. He's sought uh, all sorts of deals on immigration uh, and other matters, and he's not been able to, to achieve that, even though, uh, at least for the first two years he was president, the Republicans had the majority in both the House and the Senate. And just in the last couple of weeks with the negotiations over the stimulus bill, the historic $2.2 trillion uh, package, it was striking what little role Donald Trump personally mm -hmm. played. Uh, in that. He left it to Treasury Secretary Mnuchin to do the negotiating on Capitol Hill with Speaker Pelosi, with Senator McConnell and Senator Schumer. Uh, Trump, you know, talked to his allies on the Hill on the phone, but was not present uh, in those negotiations. In fact, he didn't even speak to Speaker Pelosi because he was so upset with her uh, still, over, the impeachment, her, over the impeachment process. They've not spoken since impeachment, if you can believe it. So, you know, the biggest $2.2 trillion deal and Trump wasn't even a part of that deal. Right. Um, just two more questions before we let you go again. Uh, Phil Rucker and uh, Carol Lenning. The book is A Very Stable Genius. Uh, Carol, I'd like to get your take on Donald Trump's, Donald Trump and the media. Uh, again, it's a big part of your book. And this is a president probably who has, not the first, but maybe has attacked the media more than any other president. And yet he also very skillfully uses the media, if not manipulates the media, to get himself a lot of coverage. We've talked a little bit about the briefings. Um, he kind of has it both ways when it comes to the media, doesn't he, Carol? I think if you, know, if you ask what are the ways this president is a genius, the first one that comes to my mind, of course, and to Phil's is, the marketing of himself. He's been yeah. um, brilliant at finding a way to turn that megaphone and that and that television screen always to him. You know, he wakes up in the morning, his executive time, instead of coming down for a national security briefing, intelligence briefing, the first thing he does is turn on the television and watch programs that he's had taped so he could see how he was covered the night before, shows he couldn't catch up with in real time, and then watches what's going on in real time on morning television. And some people have jokingly called this hate watching, but really he's watching to see what are people talking about? What are they saying about me? And also in, on Fox News, what are the Fox News hosts discussing that maybe there are some good ideas here for me and vice versa. Maybe there are some things I can share with them to, to add to my megaphone, to amplify what I'm saying. He's been brilliant at this. Every, every White House reporter uh, has a duty to cover this president, what they say. What the president says, no matter mm -hmm. who it is, it's important. But this particular president uh, has put such a focus on how he can uh, control the message of the day that it has sometimes, at least in the early stages, impacted our ability to look more deeply and, and focus our energies on what's really going on behind the scenes versus what the president is saying. Uh, I think the paper, our paper, has done an amazing job of very quickly pivoting um, to looking both at what he's saying and what's going on behind the scenes. But it was a challenge, absolutely, because of the way he operates. Uh, and Phil, you and I have been together in the briefing room. Uh, I've been staying away yeah. lately because of the coronavirus scare. And the That's number wise of you. <laughs> the seats have, number of seats have been reduced as well. Yeah. But that's one example, right, of how he may have done away with the daily briefings, but he's taken over now the briefing room that's right and and you know he's in the briefing room every day which is not something we saw before the coronavirus crisis but uh we did see him engage with reporters almost every day before before then he would do these give and take 
sessions in the Oval Office. He would do what we call chopper talk, uh, which is when he's walking across the South Lawn to board Marine One, the helicopter, and uh, stops there to take some questions. And the reason for that is because he, uh, he has such a high opinion and view of himself, he thinks he's his own best spokesman. So there is a White House press secretary. Her name is Stephanie Grisham. Uh, she has never done a press briefing. A lot of people in this country don't know what she looks like because she doesn't do those briefings. Uh, and the reason for that is that President Trump uh, wants to be answering the questions himself because he thinks he can uh, market his his product or or sell himself better than anybody else can. So your book ends with the Mueller report, or the, 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 at least it, it's included here, the Mueller report uh, and, and its findings. And since the book that Donald Trump has been impeached, he's the third president to be impeached. What did Donald Trump, what do you think, because you haven't been to talk to him about this, but what do you think Donald Trump, or what do you, what's your assessment of what Donald Trump learned from impeachment and the Senate trial? Carol, you go first. He absolutely learned that he can do a lot of things that are outside the norm for president that uh, involve substantial evidence. I'm going to quote from the Mueller report, substantial evidence of obstruction of justice. He can engage in that. He can um, do something that several members of his National Security Council thought was improper and potentially illegal, which is induce a, US, a foreign official to investigate an American citizen uh, and withhold aid um, to try to apply pressure for that. He can do all of these things and um, survive them without consequences, pay no cost for that which would have uh, leveled any other politician, much less president. And Phil, Susan Collins said she voted not to convict because she was sure that Donald Trump would learn his lesson and basically be a good boy from now on. Did he? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, Senator Collins, I think, would be the first to tell you that she regretted saying that. She, <laughs> she sort of realized the next day that that was not accurate because he didn't learn his lesson. The reason we know he didn't learn his lesson is the very day after uh, Robert Mueller testified before Congress, Trump picked up the phone and called the president of Ukraine uh, and asked for that political favor. Uh, again, uh, you know, taking a step outside uh, the bounds of norms, but also outside the law, uh, because he believes himself to be above the law. And that's been reinforced because time and again, he's escaped uh, with no consequence, with no, uh, you know, legal repercussion. Again, the book is A Very Stable Genius, Philip Rucker and Carol Lenning. Phil, thank you so much. Carol, thank you for being with us. You both, thank look, you, Bill. both look good at your, in your homes there. And we thank all the rest of you for joining us as well. Soon, hopefully, we'll be back together at the Hill Center. In the meantime, let me remind you again, East City Books, they need your help. And this is a great way to help out by buying a copy of uh, A Very Stable Genius at East City Books. Let me also recommend Little Pearl, which is very much a part of the Hill Center. It's a great little restaurant and they are doing takeout during these coronavirus days. Carol and I have enjoyed their takeout and it is wonderful. We encourage you to do so as well. So thank you again all for joining us. Uh, we'll see you soon, we hope, at the Hill Center. Meanwhile, please stay safe, stay at home, wash your hands, stay healthy, and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks, everybody.